turn to 1 John, if you will, and then uh, also turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and hold that spot for a moment. John 14 and uh, then the book of 1 John. Our Bible study class spent about six months in 1 John, and uh, we spent time gleaning everything, and then I had each person in the class come together and, you know, write a presentation based upon what they had studied. Tonight I want to speak to you from 1 John chapter 1, start off with, uh, on the subject, walking in sunshine, S-O-N-S-H-I-N-E, sunshine. 1 John chapter 1, and let's look at verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And we're going to come back to that in a moment, but I want to go to the 14th chapter now and... Uh, show you what Jesus said here verses 1 through 7 in John chapter 14 let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also and whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him, and have not seen him. So going back now to 1 John, we see John dealing with the principle in 1 John as well when he talks about uh, Jesus Christ being incarnate, God in the flesh. And uh, the only way to have a relationship with the Father is to have a relationship with God's Son. In the Gospel of John and in 1 John, we find that principle given. Um, and when he says, Jesus says, I am the way, he uses the definite article. Some translations drop it, which is extremely important. Because what it does is it eliminates multiple ways. You know, a lot of people say, well, we're all going to heaven. We're just going different ways. There's only one way. So in the next verse, he says, no man cometh to the Father but by me, which further emphasizes the absence of more than one way. Big movement in America today to promote religiosity. Everybody is okay. God loves everybody. Everybody's going to heaven, so don't sweat. It's kind of the attitude. Jesus says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also in verse 7. So if you go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, he says God is light. Verse 7, he commands us to walk in light. And then he says in verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin, which focuses on the relationship that we have to have walking in light. So in 1 John, the apostle focuses on light or the absence of darkness as the basis of fellowship with the Father. So I want to give you some thoughts about walking in the light. Number one, walking in the light is the result of being bought by the Son's blood. Walking in the light is the result of being bought by the Son's blood. So before we go forward, let me emphasize this point. The unsaved are not blood-bought, so they cannot walk in sunlight, S-O-N-L-I-G-H-T. Every time they move, they are walking in darkness. We're even told why they are walking in darkness. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sin. So the saved are blood-bought, and they can walk in the sunlight. However, there is a caveat to this, and it goes like this. Because saved people don't have the sin nature eradicated, they can drift into walking in darkness and appear exactly like an unsaved person. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, two letters 
in which he always called them brethren, but he rebuked them for not acting like brethren in the Lord. So fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is based upon our dealing with sin as quickly as possible. These Corinthians and Paul, the ones that John is talking about here, he's not talking about their losing their salvation. That's permanently purchased through the shed blood of Christ. But he is talking about damaging their fellowship relationship to the Father. In verse 5 he says, And God is no darkness, chapter 1. Chapter 1 again, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So John recognized, as I mentioned in the message this morning, he said, I write unto you that you sin not. So his goal in writing 1 John, one of the seven reasons he said he wrote it, was to limit committing sin. But then he says, but if any man sin, why did he say that? Because he knew we still had a nature that would rise up and strike out like a venomous serpent at us, and we would sin. So if we walk in the light and if we walk in the darkness indicates a choice that a believer has. So the, un the unsaved person, the one who's not bathed in the blood of Christ, that person's in darkness no matter how good his light is. Spiritually, he's headed to a destination he's going to really regret that he didn't change directions for at some point in his life. So the unsaved walks in darkness all the time and cannot fellowship with the God of light. But the saved man, because he's bought by the blood of Christ, can choose to walk in the light by dealing with his sin quickly. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us. In the Greek and in the English, both is in the present tense. The idea, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. It wasn't just effective for salvation. It's effective for dealing with sin all of the time in our lives. This logically leads, I think, to the next idea about walking in sunlight, S-O-N-L-I-G-H-T. Number two, walking in the light requires dealing honestly and quickly with sin. Walking in the light requires dealing honestly and quickly with sin. Number one was walking in the light is the result of being bought by the Son's blood. And number two, walking in the light requires dealing honestly and quickly with sin. Uh, sin is like a diseased organ. I had an experience with that recently. It doesn't get better on its own. It gets worse. So we always have two options regarding sins. The Bible many times mentions it. Number one, we can deny or ignore our sins. We can say, well, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not sinning. 1 John 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So this denial is self-deception and it results in a walk which contradicts the truth. But there's also a second option. We can confess our sins and deal with them quickly. He says, <clears throat> if we confess our sins, verse 9 of chapter 1, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess is the Greek word homo legeo. You understand homo, right? Uh, homosexual. Homo means like or, or, or same or identical, that sort of thing. Logeo means to speak or to say. So the Greek word means we say the same thing about the sin that God says about it. We don't debate him over whether it's sin. It is sin. God says it's sin. So we agree with him. That's what a confession is. We agree with God that the act was sin and we ask him to forgive us. So this is an ongoing application of the eternal effectiveness of the cleansing power of the shed blood of Jesus. I spent a little time this afternoon asking God to forgive me for an attitude problem. His blood has initial saving power over our sinful status, but his blood also continues to give power over every sin we commit. If you want to defeat sin, it's simple. You just confess. <laughs> you plead the blood of Christ. In the book of Proverbs, we're warned about trying to cover up our sins. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So covering is a way of denying, 
And confessing is the way of agreeing with God. So in 1 John, the apostle now, directed by the Holy Spirit, actually gives us the definition of sin. In 1 John 3, 4, he says, sin is the transgression of the law. In 1 John 5, 17, he says this, all unrighteousness is sin. So there are the definitions of sin in 1 John. Cover up or denial is usually based upon human opinion, or it could be based upon excuses, or it could be accepting the flimsy and unstable cultural patterns that we're told by the world are okay now. Opinion, something like this. <clears throat> I don't see anything wrong with that. It's my opinion. Well, if the Bible says that it is a transgression of the law and the Bible says it's unrighteousness, then what you and I think doesn't really matter. We go with what God said. So I don't see anything wrong with that. That's a opinion. Excuses. Well, I didn't want to do it, but you know, this came up and I had to do it and I didn't really have any choice. And then there's the culture. Well, everybody's doing it. It's acceptable. So what's the big deal? You know, cultural. Confession results when we let God tell us in his word what sin is. And when God says in this book that it's sin, then we have to deal with it as sin. Now, this term, walk in the light and walk in darkness, another term, they appear in 1 John 1, 6, and 7, and in 1 John 2, 6, and verse 11. The only two times we're told about walking in the light, walking in darkness. However, the entire book of 1 John deals with the contrast between those who walk in the sunlight and those who walk in darkness. You can actually, one of the things we did in our study time was uh, we put light on one side and darkness on the other. And even though they didn't appear, uh, the words light and darkness didn't appear in the passage with the passage under it that defined either light or defined darkness. Kind of interesting uh, study. So contrast between those who walk in sunlight and those who walk in darkness. So if you want to walk in the sunlight, S-O-N, L-I-G-H-T, <clears throat> remember it's the result of being bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to be born again. You have to be saved. You have to be converted to Christ. Number two, walking in the sunlight requires dealing with our sins honestly and quickly because if we don't, we lose fellowship with the Lord and the loss of fellowship results in increasing darkness. And then third reason here is if we walk in the sunlight, it glorifies God through appropriate behavior. It glorifies God through appropriate behavior. Look at uh, 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So the model here is Jesus. Your model is not me. You might look at my life and you might might be inspired by it, encouraged by it. I look at some of you and I'm inspired by you, your stand, and, you're, and I'm encouraged by you. But that's not the model. The model is the Son of God. That's the one that we're to model ourselves off. How does he walk? That's the way we ought to walk, 1 John 2, 6. Now, when we claim to be blood-bought, our behavior should match as closely as possible the walk of the one who shed his blood. If we claim to be blood-bought, our behavior should match as closely as possible the walk of the one who shed his blood. Look at 1 John 2, 11. <clears throat> but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. It is interesting how our attitude toward other believers reflects what's really in our hearts. Now, you and I can't see the human heart, but we can see the fruit on the limbs of the tree. And we can know whenever a person's fruit doesn't match the condition of the heart that John talks about here in a righteous status with the Lord. It's interesting to look at 1 John and see over and over how he focuses on distinction 
between error and truth, error and truth, another study that we did in our Bible class. In uh, 1 John 2, 6, which we read, he says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. It says we ought to walk as Jesus walked. He's the model for walking in sunlight. In 1 John 2, 7 and 8, John follows verse 6 with this, uh, this admonition. He said, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. And a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Now the old commandment and the new commandment are actually the same. So what John's doing here is he's not saying they're different commandments. What he's saying is that their impact or power is different. The old commandment, people who lived under the law, uh, that, you know, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself, they had to do that strictly by human effort in demand of the law. But in the New Testament, we have, according to Paul's letter to the Romans, the love of Christ shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So all that we have to do is be surrendered to the Holy Spirit and that love will automatically flow to others. He says here in verse 8, the true light now shineth. Now there are two immediate benefits of loving people as Jesus loves. One is the continuing enablement that it provides, verse 10. If you do it, he says you abide in the light. And abide means that you stay in a particular place. You abide in the light. And secondly, it overcomes the causes of stumbling. He says in verse 10, there's none occasion of stumbling in him. So John's being really practical here to the recipients. He's writing probably to churches uh, in Asia and uh, could even be the ones that he mentioned in the book of Revelation chapters uh, 2 and 3. But he's pointing out here that when behavior contradicts confession, something is very wrong. So let's look at 2.9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. And then if you go to verse 11, he says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. But those who walk in the light on the other side are those who have the right love toward everyone, including their neighbor. Here is the ongoing challenge. <clears throat> we have to constantly keep preparing to walk in the sunlight. It's not something you do at one time and it's okay. Everything around us, all the advertising on TV, all the events taking place in the world, uh, all of the people who are committing sins and passing laws to approve the sins they've committed, all of that stuff going on us all around us all the time uh, what we're finding out is this ongoing challenge is to keep walking in the sunlight. We have to make preparation for that. So my question is, uh, what are the preparations for walking in the light, the S-O-N light? Number one, be sure you're saved. Very strange in this day, the number of people who think religion and salvation are the same thing. And I talk to people about going to heaven. They say, oh yeah, I, I try to live by the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Probably the two places in the Bible that you could never live up to. <laughs> Which is why Jesus came, right? And then secondly, be quick to deal honestly and efficiently with your sins. Agree with what God's Word calls sin. Not with what your personal opinion is about an event or an action. Not by excuses as to why you did it, meaning somebody else pressured you, or just because it's acceptable to society. A lot of people today will claim to be religious if you talk to them. They'll even claim to believe in Jesus Christ. They'll even claim that they believe that he died for them. But then if you ask them, are you absolutely certain you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, if you're truly born again, you don't hope so, you know so. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's a point in 1 John 
where he writes in the fifth chapter, he says, these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So agree with what God's word calls sin, not with personal opinion, excuses, or society. S.J. Henderson wrote these memorable words in 1902. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin, a new work begun. Saying praise to the Father and praise to the Son, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father, joint heir with the Son, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the Father he spake, he spake and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious son, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, all hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Well, he had a refrain that could be added at the end of each verse. It goes like this, glory, I'm saved. <laughs> Glory, I'm saved. My sins are all part of my, my guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Here's the challenge. Walk in the sunlight. S-O-N-L-I-G-H-T. Let's stand together for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the word of God. And Lord, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And this day, many churches are afraid to talk about the blood of Christ. Many people who claim to be Christians don't want to use the word blood. Many do not, don't, don't even want to use the name Jesus in public. But we are not those who shrink back from announcing our commitment to Jesus Christ. Anywhere we go, everywhere we go, we stand up for him. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Speak to our hearts as we open the altar, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>